take it away, Matthias. Yes, uh, thanks for having us uh, in this uh, great conference. This is a uh, joint work with Titan Alon, Sena Koskun, uh, David Call, and Michelle Tetchelt. And I think uh, I see almost everybody here, so there will be uh, multiple people to answer questions later on. So we are in the middle of a big recession and it has been uh, noted that it's an unusual recession in many ways, certainly in terms of its cause, but also in its impact on women versus men in the labor market. So just to uh, give a first illustration, this picture shows you the uh, relative change in women versus men's employment, uh, comparing the Great Recession of 2007-2009 to the pandemic recession right now. So we're looking at uh, changes here after February of, uh, of last year. And what you see here is uh, that in the um, uh, Great Recession uh, back in the uh, early, uh, late uh, uh, 2000s, uh, we had um, uh, what's uh, called a man's session, namely the uh, employment of women went up. So the so positive numbers here means that women's employment increases relative to men. So even early on, there was a bit of an increase uh, for women. And as you go later in the recession, there's a substantial rise in the uh, employment of women compared to men. Uh, conversely, a decline in uh, man's employment, which uh, corresponds to this uh, concept of a man session that this uh, Great Recession had a much bigger impact on men versus women in the labor market. And the similar pattern holds for earlier recessions than before. So this uh, larger impact on man has become a common feature of U.S. recessions uh, since at least the 1970s. Now, if you look at the uh, pandemic recession, this is the uh, solid lines over here, you see that uh, women's employment has declined in relative terms overall, and has declined particularly strongly for women with children. So this compares uh, women and men with children in the labor market. A very sharp decline of uh, up to about five percentage points in the relative employment for women in this, in this group. So it's a very different outcome, uh, a really very unusual impact on working women compared to pretty much any recession we have had uh, in the past. And it's something that's really quite distinct about this recession. Now, what we do in this paper is to uh, look at this pattern in a lot more detail and also ask uh, if this holds more generally across uh, countries. So the first thing we do is to uh, look at regular recessions and ask whether this man session feature of men suffering more in usual recessions holds uh, in a number of countries or is it maybe US specific. And then we uh, turn to the pandemic recession and uh, look at this from a number of different uh, perspectives. So first we ask whether this uh, pandemic recession is a she session everywhere or maybe just in the United States. Uh, and then we go into the causes. So how much of this can be accounted for by childcare, you know, which is a bit suggested by the first picture, but maybe also by industry occupation composition, you know, by what kind of jobs women and men have. Uh, we're going to look a bit at the impact on uh, productivity, uh, and then we're going to discuss uh, the wider implications of this. So how does it matter for you know, macroeconomic features of recessions, whether it is women or men who are affected more, and also what are the long-term implications? You know, of course, when workers lose jobs in recessions that has some uh, repercussions for future productivity, there's also changes in the labor market because of the recession, such as more working from home now, but perhaps uh, also beyond. And so we will also want to uh, look a bit at the potential repercussions of that. So starting with the uh, first uh, point, uh, you know, are regular recessions men sessions? The answer is they are. So in, uh, in most countries, regular recessions indeed hit uh, men's employment more. We do this in a, in a lot of detail in the paper. I just want to show you one picture that illustrates this. So um, on uh, uh, this, this picture simply shows you by country the correlation of uh, GDP deviation, so deviation from a Hodrick uh, Prescott trend, uh, and uh, the ratio of women's versus men's uh, employment. So the negative would mean a negative correlation. So women suffer less in recession, men suffer more. And the basic thing you can see here is that this correlation is a negative in the vast majority of countries. So it's indeed the case that uh, regular recessions, meaning pre-pandemic recessions, are man sessions uh, almost everywhere. The sample of countries here is uh, the uh, Eurostat uh, area, so the so most European countries, and we add United States and Canada, which of course are countries uh, we care about. Now, moving on to this current recession, is the uh, uh, pandemic recession a she session almost everywhere? Uh, and uh, the answer, again, uh, turns out to be yes. So it is similar uh, to the United States, not in every country, but in the majority of countries. So what this uh, shows you, it's something a bit simpler. It is simply the uh, uh, post-COVID uh, log change in uh, the ratio of female to male employment. So negative numbers means uh, women lose uh, more jobs. And the comparison here is uh, Q4 of 2019 to Q2 of 2020. 
And so you see that in the uh, vast majority of countries, we have uh, larger losses uh, for women, only a few countries where men have uh, lost more jobs. You can do the same thing for hours worked as opposed to uh, employment. So also taking account of the intensive margin, you get the same pattern with actually even larger differences. So, so most countries, hours of work decline more for women, uh, relatively few, you have the uh, opposite pattern. Now, another thing we, we did in this uh, comparison is to say, well, um, most uh, countries have uh, man sessions in regular times. Men are more affected. You can also ask that uh, in these countries where uh, men did a little bit um, uh, worse in this recession, uh, are they doing as badly as they do usually, or maybe uh, at least somewhat better compared to the usual standard? You know, so, so what is the impact on employment compared to what you would expect based on the usual pattern? And if you do that, uh, then you get something uh, kind of even more um, uh, clear cut that uh, even in the countries where uh, men uh, lost uh, slightly uh, more jobs, uh, they generally still lost fewer jobs compared to earlier recessions. So here we essentially show you a correlation between the predicted change in uh, labor supply between women and men uh, compared, to the, compared to the actual. So uh, being below the 45 degree line here would mean that uh, women are affected more uh, compared to the usual pattern. And that is true in almost all countries. There's just two exceptions. One of them is Sweden, and you know Sweden is well known to have uh, quite different uh, policies uh, uh, during the pandemic um, than, than other countries. It gives you already some ideas of some of the factors that might matter here. Okay, so summarizing uh, so far, uh, we have um, uh, we have uh, man sessions in regular times, and we have a, a she session now. Why is that? Now we're going to look at childcare. But another um, natural factor to consider is the industry composition of employment. You know, what jobs do women and men have? And that does, in fact, uh, turn out to drive uh, quite a bit of the patterns. Again, we do this in some detail in the paper. I want to show you just a picture that compares this, uh, this factor for the United States between the Great Recession, 2007, 2009, and the pandemic recession uh, right now. So this picture shows you essentially employment changes uh, over uh, industries. Uh, we sort this industry by what we call cyclical volatility. So high cyclical volatility means that employment in the sector is highly correlated with the business cycle with overall GDP. And low would mean it's, a, it's an acyclical industry. We also sort these, uh, these industries by employment. So the so red industries here are industries with high female employment shares. So where um, um, relatively many women work. Blue are male industries with many men, and black are roughly balanced shares of male versus female employment. And so this is the Great Recession, so like a regular recession. And here you see kind of the very typical feature you know, that in a regular recession, the industries that have the most men really go down hard. You know, so construction, manufacturing down here, you know, those are uh, male dominated industries, and they really tanked uh, very strongly. And so you kind of see this, uh, this correlation between, uh, between male dominated industries and declining in the recession. And that accounts for a big part of the man session that we had uh, in 2007, 2009. Now I want to show you the same picture for the uh, current recession. So this uh, again shows you employment changes uh, Q4 2019 to Q2 2020. And so here you see that this is uh, completely different. So um, for the most part, there is a uh, little uh, correlation between the usual cyclical volatility and what happens now. But there is a couple of industries that are very heavily affected. And the most important one is leisure and hospitality. So, so leisure and hospitality completely stands out in its impact, and that happens to be an industry where many women work. And so if you look generally at industry data, also in many other countries, you find that this sector is, is really the most important one. And to the extent that many women there, that accounts for already a lot of the variation. So, so clearly, that is uh, an important factor. We do a few more things uh, with the cross-country data. Of course, it's cross-country data, so there's only so much you can learn from them. It's still interesting to ask, you know, what do employment losses and relative impacts on women and men uh, correlate with uh, in this uh, cross-country data? And I, I won't show you uh, tables here, but just uh, give you kind of the punchlines. So a couple of things that are associated with larger overall employment losses, and not specifically for women and men, just larger losses overall, are more extensive uh, school closures. So if schools are closed more, uh, fewer uh, people get to work. Uh, a larger share of the hospitality industry, you know, that's something already suggested by the previous picture. If you're a country, for example, with a large tourism sector, you know, then uh, on average, you're going to suffer more in this uh, pandemic. And also uh, another factor that's very important is how many jobs can be done from home. You know, I will come back to this theme that in a lot of this work, it turns out to be really uh, a super important factor. Are you able to work from home like we do right now on Zoom? 
or are you not? You know? And so that's uh, predictive at the individual level. It is also predictive uh, across countries. So countries with uh, more of those jobs are somewhat better protected in terms of employment effects uh, in, this, in this crisis. Now it turns out that at this cross-country level, relatively few factors correlate with a relative impact on women and men. In fact, the only one that is uh, clearly there is, uh, is this uh, issue of telecommuting. So uh, places where there is a relatively few jobs that can be done from home, not only have larger employment losses overall, but they also have larger employment losses specifically for women. So, so again, telecommuting, ability to work from home turns out to be an, an important factor here. Okay, everything so far was based on aggregate data. So, so just using these, these uh, national surveys and kind of uh, uh, summing numbers uh, up. Of course, we want to know a bit more about the details of the causes between what's happening. And for that, it's useful to go to the micro data. So, so then we went to uh, labor force surveys from six countries to really dig into kind of what uh, you know, accounts for, statistically speaking, for these uh, different uh, impacts. So we're doing this for the United States, Canada, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, and the United Kingdom, to some extent because uh, you know, they have data available, but also because these countries span kind of a nice range of experiences. Now, for example, the uh, European countries, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Spain, and uh, the UK generally had more interventionist labor market policies, so, so more employment protection, uh, more furlough pay compared to the United States. Uh, you also have two countries in here, Germany, Netherlands, uh, have a structure of labor supply where women uh, are relatively unlikely to work full time. So you have high participation, but uh, mothers uh, in, uh, in uh, Germany and the Netherlands usually work a part time. So it's a bit different from the United States, where we have a fairly large number of uh, mothers who work full time, where you might think this impact of childcare needs, for example, is, uh, is more important. Okay, so we want to use these surveys and now to ask uh, at the uh, micro level, so country by country, kind of what accounts for differential impacts. So the structure we're going to have is we're going to look at outcomes such as employment or hours worked. We're going to regress this on uh, gender, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, recession. So, so this data is going to be 2019 and 2020. We're going to have a recession dummy for the uh, second and third quarter of 2020. Uh, and then we're going to be, well, we're going to have some controls, but we're going to be mostly interacted, uh, in, interested in the impact on the interaction of being a female uh, and, uh, and the uh, recession. So what is the uh, differential impact between women and men uh, on employment on ours uh, in the recession? Okay. So this is going to be a measure of the basic gender gap uh, in the recession. And then we're going to do uh, more regressions to look at the causes behind this gender gap. So in particular, this regression over here uh, adds a distinction of uh, whether or not you have children and whether these children are uh, large or small, so kind of uh, preschool age or school age. And so then we're going to interact this uh, essentially separate for each uh, child group so we can ask what is the gender gap among uh, mothers, say, uh, among parents of school age children versus people who don't have children. And we're also in here going to have controls for uh, industry and for occupation and we're going to allow for differential trends uh, uh, among those in the recession. Okay, so we're going to allow, for example, that if you are uh, working uh, in hospitality in a certain occupation, that you have a differential trend uh, going into the recession. So, so kind of to filter out how much of this is because of a different employment distribution, say, uh, relative to uh, the direct impact of uh, having a child at home. Okay, and so this way we're trying to measure the overall impact and uh, put them into uh, kind of different uh, components. So I'm going to show you a few of these uh, uh, regression coefficients, always focusing on the interaction terms for, for women, so really just on the gender gaps. Of course, there's more uh, other stuff in the uh, regressions too. So the first one over here is for employment. Uh, so here's our uh, six countries. Uh, the first row just shows you what the overall employment decline is, uh, so uh, women and men combined. You see already here, it's quite different, you know, so that, that it's kind of a large employment declines in the United States and Canada. Uh, it's much smaller, uh, generally speaking, in the European countries, except the Netherlands, which already you know, kind of uh, suggests some impact of employment protection there. And then the coefficients I show you are the ones that are significant. Many are, you know, essentially zero uh, and, uh, and quite small. You know? so, so you can uh, kind of focus in on what, uh, what's important. So the first coefficients here kind of show you the overall agenda gap. So it's about a 1% uh, extra decline in employment for women in the United States, about half as much uh, in uh, Canada, not uh, significant changes in the other countries. And if you then break it down among uh, whether or not you have kids and how old these kids are, you can see that these gaps are the largest uh, among the parents of uh, school age uh, children. 
Okay, so so here it's a it's a almost a two percent uh, larger impact on the moms compared to the dads in the United States. Um, um, it's only about half as large for people without kids. Okay. There is some impact on pre-K kids, but one interesting thing we find is that uh, it's really the school age uh, uh, where these effects are large, it's not so much uh, the, the youngest uh, children. Okay. Uh, in the raw data, the youngest children, you do see a large impact, but that seems to be to a large extent accounted for by uh, industry and occupation. You know? So, so the, uh, so the uh, moms of, um, of young children have different occupations on average, and, and that accounts for a lot of their larger impact. We can do this also for uh, ours. So uh, this is now the uh, intensive margin. And here you see uh, more positive entries. Uh, so, so now also a lot of the European countries have some, uh, some changes going on. What is suggestive uh, of is that uh, in some of these countries, the employment protection kept people formally into their jobs, but, uh, but they were then just reducing hours. You know? So you were still officially working, but say in Germany, you could reduce to zero hours. So, so your intensive margin would then respond uh, quite a bit. If you uh, look at this, you see that once again, uh, uh, the school age kids is where the big impacts are. So uh, much larger hours reductions in the United States and Canada, also in, uh, in Spain and, uh, and uh, the UK. The exceptions uh, for these school age kids are uh, Germany and the Netherlands. And uh, so, so there's no impact here. As I said before, you know, those are the countries where uh, moms are relatively likely to work a part time or be out of the labor force. And so so um, what we think is suggestive of is that uh, part-time employment provides uh, um, you know, kind of less need to kind of really drop out of the labor force or reduce hours because you already have enough flexibility to deal with this extra childcare needs during uh, school closures, which is uh, less the case if you're working full-time, then there's relatively more moms or parents in general who will reduce hours. I also want to point out that after we do all of this, uh, controlling for industry trends and so on, we still get uh, quite sizable uh, gender gaps for uh, people who don't have kids at all, you know, who are either too young or kids already gone uh, to college. So it's, it's not the case that industry occupation accounts for everything. There is something about this recession compared to other recessions that uh, gives you a larger impact on women. That is, it is not just childcare or industry occupation. Okay, so there is, uh, there is uh, more stuff, but uh, you know, um, I think the important uh, uh, messages to take from the microdata are that uh, being a school age parent is important. You know, this is where the large gender gaps are. Industry occupation matters, accounts for about 20% of the impact on women in the United States. Uh, and policies you know, do seem to matter if you kind of compare outcomes across uh, countries with different uh, kind of uh, policies. One thing I'm not showing you because it's uh, you know, almost too stark to show is that uh, you can also see the microdata that uh, working from home is super important. So if you group people by whether or not they can work from home or not, uh, you see uh, essentially all of the gender gaps coming among the people who cannot work from home. So put differently, uh, being able to work from home like we can really uh, takes these effects away, both overall, much low, lower impact overall, but also essentially no gender gap. You know? so, uh, so what we do right now is really very protective for working women. It has a big impact and that's of course suggested for the future because we do expect that working from home is one of the features it is going to stay with us at least to some extent uh, beyond the crisis. Last thing I want to touch on is uh, productivity. You know, so, so I, I said- Two minutes, home, two uh, minutes, Matthias, two minutes. Again? Two minutes. Two minutes, perfect, yeah, that, that, that's just on time. Um, so um, I said that working from home uh, is kind of beneficial for women in terms of the impact on employment that in, in some sense uh, is a potentially optimistic message. If there's much more work from home in the future, you might say that this added, added flexibility will really benefit women and mothers in the labor market and give us a kind of lower gender inequality. But the issue with that is that, well, maybe uh, this uh, working from home uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, hides some inequality that's not really showing up in employment numbers. And, and the possibility here is that even if employment is not affected, there might be an impact on uh, productivity. So this picture over here is from, from the New York Times. You now this is a, a feature on a few uh, couples during the crisis. Here you see a, a working a couple, both are working, mom and dad. Uh, it's the mom right now who is uh, taking the work call. It's the dad who's relaxing at his beautiful desk. Uh, so you kind of wonder, you know, are they really equally able to, uh, to get their work done during this crisis? Employment goes on, but there might be some impact on what they can actually do. You can see this in the data. You know? so, so for example, in the Dutch data we have, there is a survey where people are asked whether they are uh, taking care of children at the same time as working. You know? And you can do this uh, for people working from home. You can then look for fathers and for mothers, for younger and for older kids, how much of their time working from home they also spend on uh, taking care of children. You see that the numbers for women are uh, much larger. 
So women really uh, are more uh, split between uh, at-home uh, work responsibilities and at-home childcare responsibilities than men are. And they're both at home. This is all conditional on being at home. So it's really a question of the division of labor in the household. There are some other papers uh, that, we, that we discuss uh, as not part of our analysis that look at some direct measures of productivity, for example, in academia. You can look at you know, who's writing working papers, who's uh, writing COVID papers uh, in this crisis. Uh, and then you also find that uh, women are doing less of that and mothers are doing less of that, which is suggestive of a differential impact on, on productivity. So, uh, so I think there's a positive message from the working at home, but there is a caveat that uh, if uh, maybe social norms you know, give you a very unequal division of labor at home, even if both parents work at home, well, then this potential may not be uh, fully realized. Okay, so that's uh, what we wanted to show you today. There's a lot more detail in the paper, so I encourage you to, to uh, look at that. But I think you uh, got the main points. We do find that the pandemic recession is a, a big recession for women in most uh, countries. We do find that industry, occupation, uh, and childcare are very important, but not the only ones. There's something that goes uh, beyond that. Uh, policies matter, and working from home is uh, hugely important. Uh, what I didn't get to talk to about, but I think you know, maybe we can get to in the discussion, is uh, the implications of that. So we argue that this uh, really matters uh, also for the macro features of um, the recession and the recovery, essentially because female labor supply is really very different the way it behaves than male labor supply. So, so whose labor supply goes down and up uh, you know, gives you different macroeconomic properties of the recession. And it also, and, and we foreshadowed this a little bit with the working from home, it also matters for inequality, for gender inequality in the labor market in the, in the long term. You know, working from home might stay, uh, the scaring effect of the recession might stay for many workers, and this will shape uh, what the labor market, market looks like in the years uh, and, and decades to come. That's all Thank we have. You. Uh, Thank, Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, our first discussion is going to be uh, Laura Pilosa. Um. They don't have a sh okay, share screen. Thank you. Can you see my slides or am I sharing the wrong screen? Yeah, if I got your slides. Looking okay. good. Perfect. Um, so, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, super, super interesting topic. So, the basic idea here is that uh, a narrative of the pandemic recession has emerged in which occupations that can't be done from home or may require high, high physical proximity, I'll get back to that, that aspect of jobs, um, have been more exposed to the pandemic recession. And moreover, there's been obviously school closures um, that happened due to social distancing measure, measures and childcare needs put further constraints on anyone that might have school aged children. So to the extent that we know that women are more likely to work in specific occupations that may you know, not have as much ability to be done from home or might have more physical proximity requirements. And we already know that women are more likely you know, spend more of their time on childcare than men. You know, we should expect that there should be a she session uh, rather than a man session. So what the paper does is it confirms this hypothesis that I think is one that we should expect to see in the data given our priors. Um, it does so for various countries. Um, it, as you can see, they, the, the authors put in a lot of work for uh, gathering detailed microdata for all different countries. And I think that's a really nice piece of the paper. Um, but what I want to focus on is actually one of the questions that I think they opened up that Matthias actually um, mentioned in passing in his, in his talk, which is that um, you know, some, some parts of the gender gap in employment are left unexplained, and I think the answers for why that's happening are, are a bit less obvious. Okay, so um, here is basically my version of man session versus she session. So everyone's familiar now, I think, with these kind of pictures, given the first paper that was given. So what I'm looking at is the employment to population ratio of males relative to females. Uh, during different recession periods. So each bar corresponds to a specific recession period. And you can very clearly see in this picture, and I know Aishagul is going to be upset into a spider plot, but I think it becomes really apparent just from this, that um, the employment gap, you know, starts favoring women normally in typical recessions. And if you start looking at the pandemic recession, you get the completely opposite result. So it really is something that's um, very much out of the norm. So the way that the, the authors actually show this uh, is, it, is through 
um, I think rather convincingly through a series of regressions. So they start basically by looking at a basic gender gap regression, which just has some standard controls like race, edu education, and so on, and has a female dummy, but then a female dummy interacted with uh, whether, whether, when, whether or not you're in the COVID recession period. So they're interested in, in the, the coefficient beta three on the female interaction dummy. So to understand how much of the gender gap that you would get in either employment or hours outcomes during the COVID recession, coming from these differences in occupations or industries, basically what the, the next step is, how does this coefficient change if you add in job or industry or occupation dummies? So that's the next step is adding that in, look, then looking at the change in the coefficient on, on the, the female dummy interactive coefficient. And finally, to the extent that having kids is gonna matter for whether or not your employment outcomes change, we're gonna do a further interaction of whether or not you're a female in the, in the COVID recession and then you know, those groups of dummies for different children. So here I'm just some, uh, pulling their, their results, kind of uh, the ones that I thought were the most relevant for this. So what you can see is that if you look at the gender gaps in employment in hours from that first basic regression, you get these large numbers. That's the, the, the she session, which you don't get in a standard recession. So comparing to the rate recession. Um, once you start including these job controls, you start to see that the, the gap declines. So it is the case that as we expected, controlling for occupation and industry matters. Um, and then finally, once you add in those, those interaction terms, they show that actually having kids does matter. There is some variation in what happens to employment and hours outcomes depending on the age of kids. So I think these types of regressions actually confirm the narrative that you know, occupation and childcare are things that really matter for this, this uh, she session narrative. Um, and what makes it even more convincing is that none of those patterns emerge if you look at prior recessions. But I think the more puzzling thing that's left unexplained is that even if you look at women who have no children, um, there still remains a gap between uh, men and women. So why, why would that be? Um, at first, to me, it wasn't really obvious and was, it was, was quite surprising. So part of the answer, I think, does come from this issue of telecommuting. So if the authors kind of redid their regressions, looking at actually people who ended up telecommuting during the pandemic versus those who did not end up telecommuting during the pandemic, and for that, they use actual um, the CPS questionnaire in which they actually asked during the pandemic whether or not you were taking up um, work from home. And what you can see is that if you look at the regression outcomes during, uh, for those who did telecommute, you get the same pattern um, in terms of the, going from the basic gender gap to the, to the one where you include industry con controls and that the industry matters still. But now you see no difference among uh, women who have children of different ages. So that suggests, you know, that further supports this narrative in that it's saying those who can telecommute may, may be able to more easily take care of kids. Now, by that, what I mean, of course, I'm sure all the parents in the audience are like, their jaws are dropping. What I mean there is that the idea is you can watch your children um, and maybe shirk a little bit at work or not be productive and just not get fired. So that's the idea here. Now, if you look at the no telecommuting uh, regressions, you get a similar pattern, except the, the gap between men and women for those who don't have kids still remains. So to me, that puzzle, you know, part of it is being explained by the telecommuting, but then even if you look at those who were not able to telecommute and you're looking at individuals who don't have to make a choice, let's say between going to work and staying home to take care of kids, you're still seeing this gender gap. And um, I don't think any of the stories put forth in the paper are able to really kind of get at that. So, I want to just spend a few moments kind of trying to think about what are possible reasons that could be coming about. And I also just want to mention that the pattern doesn't hold for other countries. Like once you do this separation, um, the gender gap actually disappears also for like the UK and the Netherlands for the no telecommuting workers. Okay, so one possibility is that, you know, if we're still within the realm of the story of, of caring for people, but maybe we just didn't capture all, all, all the relevant types of caring. So the first is, if you look into the CPS data, and I think this is what the, the authors use, but um, you can let me know if I got this wrong. The third category includes individuals who have no kids of their own, um, but may also include 
individuals who live in a household in which there are kids. So that's one possibility is just that, you know, that the fact that you're still getting a significant difference in that third category is because despite the fact that maybe women don't have kids of their own, you're still picking up people who are helping to take care of their whatever siblings, children, or so on and so forth. And it's still the case that women may be more likely to take up those kind of duties than men. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that um, there's elder care. And, you know, I, I haven't seen any evidence on this, but it's also possible that one of the things that need to happen is that, um, you know, older parents start to have to take care of their, their sick, their sick uh, parents, and women are going to be more likely to take on that role as well. So I think that's something that you can actually check in the CPS as well, because you can see all these household relationships and who's living with whom. And if that kind of wipes out the, the gender gap that's still in that category, I think it's, then it kind of still fits in the same narrative of uh, this idea that women just have to care more for others. More generally, of course, child care matters probably the most, but then, you know, it's still within in, in the story of caring for others that, that women have been relatively more hurt during this recession. Uh, the second possibility is this idea of physical proximity of a job, which um, is not discussed or brought into the paper at all. So what do I mean by that? Um, so I have uh, done earlier work with Simon Mangi and Alex Weinberg in which we use data from the ONET to characterize different occupations as either having a high or low ability to be done from home and as having either high physical or low physical proximity requirements. So the the indexes that we come up with for each occupation come from questions about the job uh, duties that are done on the job. So, you know, whether it has to be done on si outside, whether there's a lot of physical labor, how many, you know, how many people are around you during work that are within arm's length and so on. And if you take, if you look at those indices uh, across different occupations, what you find is that occupations that are lo lower from home, meaning that they are unable to be performed from home, more generally speaking, there are also going to be ones that have high physical proximity associated with them. Um, so those things are positively correlated. So here's an idea, and I have no idea if it's true, but I think it's worth entertaining. If women are more risk averse than men, which I think is something that I've documented in, in other work uh, with Patricia, Jessica, and Fawcett, but is, um, you know, there's a host of papers that have elicited risk preferences and shown, shown the same thing. Um, maybe even within a specific occupation, if women are more risk averse, they might be less willing to actually kind of take on the, the health risks that are associated with going back to work. Then you might, you know, get some similar patterns as what you're seeing because those, those two job attributes are correlated and then what's not being picked up um, and still matters even for women who have no kids is this, this idea that it's risky to go to work. Um, I would have originally thought that that's kind of a um, a crazy idea, but there is a lot of evidence and evidence in my own work that suggests that these differences in risk attitude actually matter for job search outcomes um, pretty, uh, pretty significantly. So the, the other thing I want to point out, though, is that you can use our, so we have our, all these measures are available online, so you can download them freely. And one nice thing about that is that you'll be able to merge them with the CPS occupation data. And what that will allow you to do is actually um, one, distinguish between these two characteristics of an occupation, but it would also allow you to compare, you know, run similar regressions prior, you know, in the Great Recession uh, or earlier recessions in which you don't have information, obviously, on telework take-up rates, because that was only fielded during the COVID recession, but because these are characteristics of an occupation, which we define sort of in a separate survey, you can actually run similar regressions um, in earlier recessions and then show us the, the differential um, regression coefficients in, you know, pr prior recessions and then in the COVID recession. So the last thing I want to just touch on is what to expect going forward, which I think Matthias pointed out, uh, mentioned that maybe we, this will be part of the discussion later on. Um, you know, we, we might expect that there's a large literature that says that losing your job is costly and has very persistent effects on, on earnings and employment. So this evidence um, that women have been more severely affected during the COVID recession is actually not looking so good, right? Um, but we, there is some evidence that maybe makes me a little bit more hopeful, and that comes from uh, recent evidence from data collected by the New York Fed Survey of Consumer Expectations. So 
the New York Fed survey of consumer expectations is, is a survey that they, they field in-house, and so they can add questions in an ad hoc fashion whenever they like. So one of the questions that, that, were, that was added in January was the following. So approximately how many hours per week do you, did you spend doing the following activities in the last week? So this is going to apply to January 2021. And then they asked a hypothetical, consider a situation where, you know, COVID is gone, schools have completely reopened, and everything goes back to normal. Uh, what do you expect to be your time allocation across various activities? So to me, the evidence suggests, you know, a little bit that they could be short-lived. And I just want to thank my, my colleagues who are actually working on, uh, on this data, Ezem and Wilbur. So, this is the data from the Survey of Consumer Expectations, and what you, you definitely see playing out in this data exactly as what you see in the CPS, that women are actually taking on much more childcare hours than men. But if you look at the expectations about what's going to happen after COVID, whenever that may be, um, you, you see a significant reduction in the number of hours per week that women are going to spend on childcare uh, relative to men, where the reduction is a little bit smaller. So this suggests to me that as soon as things go back to normal, I think we can expect that the child care angle will, will be eliminated. Of course, the industry occupation issues are, are going to remain and we're going to have the, you know, the, the scarring effect might still be there. But one thing to point out, I think that's different about this recession compared to other recessions is that because it was such a widespread kind of shock in which all restaurants closed, um, whole sectors were just completely shut down. The signaling, kind of, the signaling involved in a spell of unemployment might be slightly different in that, um, you know, people who typically lose their jobs in recessions, maybe there's a, more of a signal attached to it in that they're kind of like a lo lower quality worker compared to those who don't get laid off and so on. Whereas in this recession, it could be the case, although the evidence, uh, you know, remains to be looked at, maybe uh, that signaling effect will be less severe. And if that's the case, then we can expect going forward that um, the lasting impacts on women relative to men will, will not be as, as bad as um, previous research suggests. So to conclude, I think this is a really nice paper that synthesizes a lot of evidence on, on this notion of a she session. I didn't touch on any of the evidence across countries, but um, there's a lot of work that, went, that was involved in um, collecting the data for looking at various countries. And I think it, it, it definitely supports the narrative that women were just in sectors or occupations that were more likely to be exposed to the COVID shock. And conditional on not being able to work from home and with these childcare needs, women took on more of the childcare role. I think this question kind of remains an open one. I think it's a really interesting one. Like what, what is it about this recession then that is making it bear more on women than men if it's not about childcare, if it's not about the industry and occupation composition of women relative to men? Thank you very much, Laura. Our next discussion is uh, Lucas Carol Barbunas. Uh, okay, so can you see my screen? Okay, uh, so thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, this is a, a massive uh, paper in terms of um, data. So there is a very rich set of uh, empirical observations on hours worked, and uh, as you saw, this is uh, disaggregated by gender, by family status, by industry. So there are, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there are thousands of moments in there. So I thought for this discussion, what I would do is uh, so to ask the question: What do we learn from this uh, data work? Okay, so what 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 is the kind of the punchline, and are we surprised? So uh, my prediction is this is going to be the to-go paper in terms of facts. It's, it's very comprehensive and very interesting. So I'm, I'm not going to discuss the facts. I'm going to take them as even and then sketch a framework and try to learn from these observations. And the framework I'm going to show you is going to have four key elements that I think uh, are important when thinking about the pandemic recession. So it's going to have um, uh, gender. Uh, it's going to have home production. So childcare is one component, but there are other components also cooking maybe, or uh, grocery shopping should be in here. Uh, there's going to be an asymmetry uh, between time inputs and what I'm going to label uh, a social norm, and I'm going to show you that. And then there's going to be partial insurance. Uh, so let me jump right into the, the model um, that I'm going to sketch. So the, the economy is going to be populated by uh, heterogeneous households. 
and the households are going to be heterogeneous in terms of their uh, consumption weights, in terms of their technologies at home and their technologies in the market. And there is a lot of notation here, so I apologize, but I'm going to, I'm going to denote, to ease the, you know, the way you, I present it to make it easier, I'm going to put in blue color the, the source of heterogeneity, okay, so why households are heterogeneous. So first, let me begin by describing the utility and consumption. So households are going to maximize this um, standard uh, value function, where uh, uh, this is not mysterious, this is very standard. So there's going to be log preferences with respect to the consumption aggregator. And then all the action is going to come through the consumption aggregator, uh, which is not going to be just uh, spending or just consumption, but it's going to be a combination of various inputs, various sectors, and the inputs are going to be both in terms of spending and in terms of uh, hours. Okay, so let me uh, uh, go over this expression. Uh, so the omega here is going to be a preference weight, a consumption weight for uh, what I'm going to label a market good. So X0 is going to be something like uh, eating in a restaurant or uh, utilities or insurance or gas. Okay, so it's a good that it's more intensive in spending and not so much in time. Okay, so that's I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to label the market good. And then there's going to be a series of uh, home produced goods, like in Gez and Becker, uh, indexed by K. So you can think of different. Uh, so one of these could be childcare, the other could be you know, cooking or whatever is you know being produced partly at home and partly through market inputs. And the inputs that go into these K goods are going to be uh, spending uh, hours by females and hours by males. Okay, so the household is going to use three inputs to produce these goods. And the key uh, assumption here, the way I set it up, is that female hours are going to have a different substitutability. So this input here is going to have a different substitutability with spending than male hours. And I'm going to label that uh, social norm. Okay, so it's, it's interesting to, to understand why this is the case, but here I'm going to take it as a feature of technologies. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to think of this sigma elasticity that tells you how much hours are substitute to spending is greater than the phi elasticity, which tells you how much hours in home production of men are substitutable with, with spending, okay? So I'm gonna assume that sigma is gonna be higher than phi, and this is gonna make women more responsive and men more uh, insensitive. Uh, and then I'm gonna move into the, the market sector where um, there's going to be a, a straightforward linear technology that converts labor supply into earnings for every gender G. So the earnings, uh, labor market earnings of gender G is going to be the product of the weights uh, with labor supply. Okay, so labor supply is going to be your endowment minus total hours spent at working at home. And then the weights, I'm going to write it uh, as having two components. The one I'm going to call alpha and the other I'm going to call epsilon. And the difference between the two, as I'm going to show you later, is that the one is going to be uh, uh, insurable and the other is going to be uninsurable. So the alpha component is going to, you can think of it as a permanent shock to wages uh, that is more difficult to insure, whereas the epsilon component, you can think of it as a transitory shock uh, to wages that is easier to insure. So what I'm going to do uh, before I, I move to an application uh, is uh, um, I'm, go I'm going to study um, a sequence of planning problems. Okay, so I'm going to study a sequence of planning problems. And the, the goal here is to derive the allocations of time and spending, and then try to filter the facts in the paper through this framework and ask what do we learn. Okay, so uh, the way I'm going to solve this model is uh, uh, study these uh, planning problems. So first, let me be precise. So a household here is going to be a, a sequence of uh, time endowments, uh, consumption weights, uh, production efficiency at home, and then the uh, shocks in wages, uh, the, transit, the transitory shocks and the permanent shocks. And then I'm gonna start the planning problems defined at the level of what I'm gonna call an island. So what is an island here is gonna be, we're gonna partition the economy in, um, the, the, which consists of all the households into different islands. So the islands is gonna consist uh, of households that share the same sequences of everything except for the transitory component of wages. Okay, and then I'm going to study uh, island level planning problems 
with the goal being of solving for the allocations of spending and time within an island. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because that's going to give you some intuitive notion of insurance within an island. Okay, so within an island, uh, all these shocks are going to be perfectly insurable in wages. And that's why uh, I'm studying these uh, planning problems. And then all other shocks, home, home production shocks and permanent shocks of wages are not going to be insurable because by assumption here, islands cannot trade with each other. Okay, let me spend just a minute going through this problem. So uh, the planner is going to maximize uh, this average utility within every island and uh, is going to do it sub subject to a resource constraint that says a total spending equals total uh, labor earnings. Uh, just a quick comment here on the spending. Uh, so in the background, there's going to be general equilibrium when everything is linear and easy. So uh, there's going to be an assumption that total output in the economy can be converted at a rate of one to one uh, in terms of the market good, which is the numeraire, the x0, and at a rate of one over pk for other goods. So pk is going to be the relative price of goods. So one thing I'm going to do later, for example, is, is vary this pk. So I'm going to think the price of childcare increased massively in COVID. How does this affect the allocations? Okay, so that's an, that's an aggregate show. So let me, before I show you the application, just make two comments on the, on the framework uh, and how to relate it to COVID. Uh, so the, the first is, uh, so the nice thing about studying these planning problems is that it's easy to solve everything analytically. So uh, you can write an expression for the inverse of the marginal utility, which is the, just the multipliers on, the, on these constraints. Uh, and what you get here is that um, the marginal utility basically depends only on uh, that's why I call it uninsurable. The uninsurable component of wages for men and women and nothing else. In particular, the transitory shocks are gonna be fully insured. Now, the, uh, if you don't like the island model, uh, the rest of the analysis still, you know, you, you can still do it conditional on Lambda by studying the, you know, uh, the, the, the demand system coming out of here, conditional on Lambda. But this already gives you, I think, an intuitive interpretation of the pandemic because the, um, you know, the way I'm going to think about the pandemic mainly is a constant lambda pandemic. So it's going to be a transitory shock on other things, except for alpha that I'm going to keep relatively constant when thinking about the pandemic. And, uh, the, you know, this, this expression formalizes that. Now, the second line maps the lambda into the, the allocations. Uh, and that gives you an intuitive, uh, you know, sense of what is the marginal utility here, which is just the inverse of uh, the market value of total consumption. Okay, so what is the market value of total consumption for a household is the uh, total expenditure. This is how much, you know, groceries and, and uh, schools and utilities and everything you buy in dollars, plus the imputed value of home production. Okay, so home production is not tradable, so it's not, you know, part of... GDP here and part of measure consumption, but true consumption is different from expenditures and that's where it comes from. So when we study the pandemic and we think that lambda is constant, it doesn't mean that consumption is constant or, or time is constant. It means that the sum of these things is constant, okay? So as, I, I'm, as I'm gonna vary the shocks, the, the primitives here, there's gonna be reallocation, like maybe you reduce your consumption of spending of this thing and put more time on home production but everything is gonna adjust in a way that makes lambda constant, unless the permanent component of weight is moved. Now, the, the second point before I move to the application is gonna be the, so what comes out of the, the model is gonna be an intra-period, uh, first order condition that dictates how the household allocates time between uh, females in home production and males, and that's pretty intuitive, okay? So it depends positively on the, on the relative consumption weights uh, it depends positively on uh, male wages. So if male wages go up, uh, the household is going to direct more time into female home production. It, it depends negatively on, on female wages, uh, meaning if this goes up, uh, the, this ratio is going to go down. Uh, and finally, and that's uh, something I'm going to discuss later as well, uh, there is this PK in here. It's the price of... Uh, goods that can be purchased in the market, but for which you can also produce them at home. Uh, and if you see here, the key elasticity that determines how much the input ratio changes with this price is gonna be this difference between the two elasticities. 
and in particular because of the because of the way I nested things, when uh, good K becomes more expensive, so suppose childcare becomes more expensive, so the household is going to try to reallocate inputs away from spending towards something. So how much goes to men versus females is going to depend on the intra good elasticity versus the elasticity across goods. And because I'm going to have sigma greater than phi, I'm going to get this asymmetry. Okay, so where women shift more of their time to um, home production as opposed to men. Okay, so let me just do a, a kind of an application. So what's the goal here? The goal is uh, I want to think of some data. So it's not real data, it's made up data. Okay, just to be clear, I made up some data, uh, which I think, however, is intuitive. And then I'm going to solve the model under this data. I'm going to say, what does it take for the model to match this data? And then I'm going to shock the model and try to match uh, some of the empirical observations in the paper and ask what the we learn. Okay. So the application is going to have, let's think about two, two households. Uh, the, the one I'm going to call the symmetric household and they don't have kids. Uh, they both earn one dollar. They both work 40 hours. Uh, they both work five hours in uh, home production, say they cook. Uh, and then all their spending is concentrated in the market. Okay, so the, the, the couple without kids spends everything on X0 and nothing on uh, home production. And then I'm going to think another household with kids uh, that uh, they also have symmetric outcomes in the market. So they earn one and they, they work 40 hours in the market. But here the female input. Uh, is, uh, you know, the, the female puts more hours uh, in home production relative to the, to the male. And also this household spends 5% of their basket into say childcare or whatever is this good. Okay, and that's, that, that, that household starts from asymmetric initial condition. So that household is gonna react differently to the shocks. Uh, so that's gonna, I'm gonna take that as an input. And then I'm gonna vary the shocks. The shocks are gonna be transitory shocks to wages or the price of childcare or the consumption weights, and then ask what does the model produce and compare that to the empirical observations in the paper. So as I said, there are you know, thousands of moments in this paper. So I'm gonna pick only three that I think are most, uh, the most important, three of the most informative. The one is ours uh, felt by, by a lot, okay? That's 36, that's the first diff. And then there, uh, you know, the regressions in the paper, you can think of them as, uh, you know, double differences and triple differences. So the, there is a gender gap, even for households without kids. So this 6% means that if hours fell for, for, me, for men by 33%, for female, they fell by 39%. Okay, that's the way to read that. But this gap is much larger for households with kids. Okay, so the triple difference is the, you know, con so is the difference over time, the difference over gender, and then interacted with whether you have kids or not, is, is roughly 12%. And that's kind of the uh, key informative moment. Okay, so let me walk you through some comparative statics. Um, so first, I'm gonna show you some comparative statics with respect to uh, female wages, the transitory components. So all the figures I'm gonna show you will have the same format, so let me explain one. So why axes always have labor? Uh, and uh, x-axis has the thing I'm varying, and I'm thinking as, uh, you know, the shock moving before COVID relative to after COVID. So before COVID is gonna always be at one, uh, or most of the time, and labor is always normalized to one for everyone, okay? And then I'm gonna show you in the, in the left panel, the, the first household, the one without kids, and the other with, the right panel, the household with kids, and uh, uh, the blue is gonna be the, the male input, and the female input in production is gonna be the, the black input, okay? So here what you get is uh, the, for the household with kids, the female input is, is way more elastic. In fact, what I'm plotting here is the, the constant lambda labor supply. So it's, it is, the slope here is the freeze elasticity. So why is that? Because I'm varying epsilon, and remember I saw you lambda before, where lambda doesn't vary with epsilon because of complete markets. So, uh, a point here for example so that's a, a free elasticity of one which gets much like okay so this is quite non-linear it gets much larger here this is smaller than one this is around one gets much larger now for the household without 
kids, the free cell elasticity is uh, much smaller for, for even for females. It's roughly one third. And this matches the evidence we have on free cell elasticity. So the gap in gender uh, elasticity of labor supply is concentrated in, among married women with kids. And that's kind of the labor supply literature and the model is going to give you that. Okay, so why is that? Because, uh, because of the social norm I built into the, the technology uh, or preferences, whatever, you know, in the Gesenbecker model, they're the same thing. Uh, uh, females in the model here are going to start with a higher initial uh, um, home production time. So a small shock that's going to move this time, you know, by given percent is going to matter a lot for labor because labor and, and home production enter additively in the time constraint. Okay, so starting with something big, uh, if you shock it, it's going to matter a lot for labor. And that's what's giving you the asymmetry. Uh, now, for, for men, that's not the case. Okay, so men are insensitive here. Okay, so they, they don't move much. Their labor supply is relatively inelastic. Uh, now, you can uh, um, look at permanent shocks. Okay, so uh, permanent, remember I had these log preferences. So with log preferences, permanent shocks on wages, uh, you have the standard result, income and substitution effects cancel out. But here I have non-separability, so this doesn't apply. And actually the non-separability here is so strong for females that a permanent shock in their wages for the, for the, cup, for the household with kids is going is gonna, is gonna to move labor a lot for women. Uh, if you do a permanent uh, uh, male wage shock, actually you find something interesting. So for men, income substitution effects almost cancel out. So this is one, okay, it doesn't move much. Uh, but you get a negative cross uh, elasticity, okay? So you get a negative cross elasticity. And that's because the, you know, the household is poorer. So they wanna consume less of everything. And what is the most flexible input of the household is female labor supply at, at the home for the household with kids. So here you're gonna have home production time going down and labor supply going up, which is exactly the opposite of what we saw in the data. Okay, so you can ditch this case as uh, uninteresting. And um, my kind of most favorite uh, interpretation of the, the pandemic comes in these two figures. The first is the shock to the price of goods that have a close substitute at home. Uh, childcare is one example. You can think of other, you know, restaurant eating is another. Uh, we, so this shock is not gonna move relative labor supplies for the household with, with uh, no kids. But as I was explained before, it's gonna move here labor supply uh, asymmetrically for the uh, household with kids if this elasticity is greater than this elasticity. Two minutes, Lucas, two minutes. Yes, perfect. Uh, so you get, and you know, quantity, again, this is kind of a toy model, so, uh, but quantitatively. So one way to think about the results in the paper is, you know, childcare was not, exchange in March to May. So we don't observe price in the data. So if we know the elasticities, I can use the empiric, I can use the diff and diff and diff to, uh, to infer, okay, to reverse engineer what is the change in the price of these goods that leads to the allocations we saw. And, you know, like a 15 percentage point gap would, uh, would imply a change in this price by a factor of, by 100%. Okay, so the price of childcare doubled in the, in the pandemic, if you believe my elasticity numbers. Okay. Uh, I think the most, uh, kind of the, the most natural way probably to think the pandemic is a change in the uh, consumption weights. So here I'm gonna change the, the consumption weight on uh, the market good. So people didn't gonna consume goods at the market, they won't consume them at home. And that's not gonna, this is gonna drive both labor supplies down, but in a symmetric way for the household without kids. For the household where the female is doing more home production initially, again, you get the larger responsiveness. Okay, so that, that's, you know, presumably mostly related with uh, kids production, but also other ho home users. Okay, so maybe it's cooking or maybe it's laundry. So if uh, women are doing more to begin with, the model will, will give you this asymmetry. And again, you can generate a large asymmetry. So let me just uh, conclude uh, by taking stock. So um, given the presentation we saw and the, the, the facts and, the, and filtering the facts through the model, uh, I wanna ask the question, is it uh, puzzling? I think not so much, 
Okay, so I think you, you can think the Great Recession as a combination of uh, men's shock, uh, partly an insurable shock and partly an uninsurable. I'm saying uninsurable because consumption also fell more persistently. And yes, that's construction manufacturing driving that. And you can think of the pandemic recession as a shock that uh, reallocated inputs away from the market towards the home sector. And Lambda didn't move much because it was transitory. Uh, so I think, you know, the paper gives valuable facts where you can use them to get a quantitative answers on either the shocks or the elasticities or a combination of both. Uh, what I think, what, one recommendation I have is would miss from the paper is um, in studying labor supply, it's very difficult to study labor supply without also thinking about wages, expenditures, and home production. So any additional data, so some of it is in their home production time in particular, is there in the Dutch data set. But, you know, bringing additional observations on wages and expenditures uh, should be very helpful. Thank you.